This is Jeff Mucci with RCR Wireless News, and we're here today with InterDigital. Uh, we have Alan Carlton, who is Vice President of InterDigital Europe. Uh, he's based in London. And we have Jim Nolan, who is EVP of Solutions for InterDigital. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Jeff. Now, Jim, where are you located? Uh, in Melville. It's uh, out on Long Island, about 30 miles east of Manhattan. Okay, well, I notice you're wearing a sweater. Here in Austin, it's getting a little bit warmer. I've got short sleeves on, and uh, I think uh, spring and summer may be upon us. But uh, Not uh, this weekend. Uh, you're rubbing it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, uh, gents, uh, 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 this episode is going to be inserted in a coders show uh, either this week or the upcoming week, and the topic today is uh, the role of software and code in 5G. So I'm going to open up with that question. I'll let either one of you – Maybe give me your first response. I, I could go with that first, Jim, if you like. Yeah. Uh, I think I think this 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 is a very easy segue into a discussion on NFV and SDN, and these are really the, probably the two cornerstone topics. Uh, you know, the, the cornerstones on which five G will be built. You know, as we see it, really, what's happening with uh, the emergence of these technologies is is really it's we're entering into the third wave of networking. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a, a back to the future move if you actually look at what NFV and SDN are actually all about. You know, but basically SDN is about creating the separation of the control plane from the data plane, and NFV is about pulling service logic from uh, hardware. Essentially, these are basically moves that we can mirror back all the way back to SS7 and AIN and the soft switching revolutions of ten or so years ago. What's really happening? Back to your core question is, is there's a move to pull all this service logic and these controller entities and create a much more innovative environment for third-party software developers to literally reinvent the way networks operate. So it's a thrilling time, and I think that is one of the things that the 5G revolution will certainly bring, uh, yeah, a, a much more open marketplace for software developers to do incredible things. If I, if, I, if I could just to, to, to broaden that out a little bit in terms of what is 5G, and that's really, that's really a difficult question to answer. I think when you went from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G, it was simple. It was analog radio to digital radio to low-rate broadband, the LTE 4G finally broadband in your hand. But 5G is, you know, it's not as much about radio access technology. Sure, there are there are use cases being defined by NGMN and other groups, and there are requirements that laid out as, you know, gigabit per second, very dense deployments, and, and everything pretty much is just one order of magnitude increase like they've been in previous generations. You know, one-tenth latency, you know, ten times the capacity, ten times the throughput, you know, not, not necessarily exceeding, uh, you know, per link, but in terms of total capacity. But if you look at those radio specifications, that becomes more transparent to the end user in the network. It's abstracted away in terms of what we do with the devices. What's really more important in 5G is, is the cost. Um, it's really about what's the cost of, of delivery. If you look at today's network, you know, a couple of dollars per gigabyte, and you know, it's still in order or two uh, above what wireline costs are, and I think ultimately 5G is about reducing cost, again, an order of magnitude like the other parameters, from a couple of dollars to half a dollar or less per gigabyte, getting closer to what wireline is. And really, uh, the, the elements that make up 5G will be more amorphous, more, more diverse than what other Gs have been, and, and software is really the driver of that. And what makes it more amorphous is that you don't need to wait until a new standard for many of the innovations to happen. So Alan mentioned uh, software-defined network and network function virtualization, and then there's things in terms of Internet of Things and objects. But really what it all comes down to is, is it's not one singular standard or group of standards. It's a whole new set of broader capabilities largely being driven by our ability to do it much faster in software than we, we could have done it in terms of just doing it in, in hardware. So I think you're going to see many elements of what will be 5G, and in particular SDN and NFE, before you even see 5G access networks. You'll see a big move towards uh, 5G capabilities, but they'll happen independent of, of, of another generation of, a, of an access standard. 
Would that um, would that mean you might see it in a, uh, someone stand up a, a virtualized 5G initiative, and it you know it has nothing to do with the radio. It's all it's all in the network. You can see elements of it. You, I think you will see elements of it. I think you'll see costs get there. I think you'll see you know delivery and distribution concepts get there, and, and they won't be they won't be dependent on a standards timeline for those for those to happen. Absolutely. What's well, uh, I know that Interdigital uh, spends a lot of money and time on uh, research and development. You've got some twenty one thousand patents, one hundred and seventy engineers, and I think one of the stats was. Uh, Ninety percent of those, eighty percent of those uh, folks have advanced degrees. Uh, so you spend a lot of time in in the standards world. Uh, as it relates to to five G, uh, maybe you could walk us through um, when when do folks start developing code versus writing papers and defining a, a spec. I'd say now I'm going to let Alan follow up on this because he's driving a lot of our five G efforts, but. What you see is, is, think about it this way, is that although some of the 5G standards are emerging now in BGP and other standards bodies, people are developing solutions, proof of concept, and, and, and fundamental pieces of the solution that are code already. So, uh, you know, I think people think about it in terms of, you know, some of the PhD and algorithm types that it's, it's purely math at this point, but the reality is, is that people are already developing uh, proof of concept systems that are maybe pieces or elements of the system, and and most of most of them are real implementations. I think when you go to a trade show like NWC, that's the difference you see these days is the maturing of the industry. How much you see is actual real uh, interworking on top of real commercial hardware. When somebody brings a new concept, it doesn't sit standalone anymore. Now I'll turn it over to Alan, who, who really can give you a better perspective of where it goes from that. The, the standardization process. Sure, and, and I'll, even, I'll even describe it from the perspective of some of the projects that we're working here in, in London. Uh, we, we're involved in a number of Horizon 2020 initiatives, and uh, they're, they're, they're quite SDN-centric. And I can tell you the people that we're hiring here to support these projects are software developers. Because the nature of, of the, the, the development work and the research work requires software developers to, get, to jump right in and write application level software uh, code on SDN platforms. And uh, uh, so it's very much central to it. And it may not seem like a, a very logical uh, connection, uh, but we're working on a project uh, in Horizon 2020 called X-Hall, but it's basically about unifying front hall and back hall technologies into a common unified management framework. Where is that energy to create that uh, innovation going? It's in it's application level development on SDN platforms. Develop the management algorithms, the load balancing software, the, the quality of service policy controls. It's, it's, it's essential. Uh, software is driving 5G. What kind of uh, software tools and, and frameworks are being used for that initiative in Berlin? I think it's, at this point in time, it's just a little bit too early to, to, to say exactly what those are at the moment. Uh, the, we're in the early stages of this, uh, this interesting uh, project, X Hall. Uh, and at this moment in time, we're, we're, we're developing prototypes, we're developing a uh, proof of concepts. Uh, uh, we'd be in a position to talk more deeply on, on those aspects for, probably towards the end of the year. Okay, and, and then, you know, I've had a couple calls, uh, our, our previous episodes on, on coders talks about, um, we talk about scalability, hyperscale, we talk about reliability, and we, we've talked about the different frameworks and runtimes being used today and how they've evolved over time, but when you're in the prototype stage, what if you could just elaborate on what types of languages people are, are developing those prototypes, knowing they're going to have to change them before they go into commercial deployment. Okay, uh, my guys are, are developing in, 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 in C, C++ uh, development languages, basically okay. is serving our purposes more than more than adequately. Yep. I think you see a mix of different uh, solutions. So when when we when we talked to you earlier about different uh, things we work on, say Internet of Things. One of the issues you, you, you talked to was scalability. So even when you're building proof of concept systems, when you're talking hosted services or largely scalable systems, you have to move to 
scalable implementations fairly quickly. So using you know, using concepts, you know, well, obviously Java, C++, you know, Node.js, there's, there's all different constructs used, but frameworks like Docker, you know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, of frameworks that, that you would use in terms of open, open source uh, code as well that, that allow you to build scalable systems more quickly that would be hosted um, cloud-based uh, solutions. So I think what you see uh, is, is that kind of merging of, of, of less of the traditional uh, core network technology that was box-based to more of an IT type of or web-based type of deployment that's more scalable. So even in, even in prototyping, when we talk about things that are, that are still very early or pre-commercial from an Internet of Things solution perspective, we already look at them in, in terms of scalability and building those solutions to be scalable front end. Well, let's jump back to the uh, Horizon 2020 example. In my understanding, that's a European Union initiative where they've um, the, the EU has is committed to spend a substantial amount in billions of dollars um, uh, on certain technology initiatives. Maybe you could, uh, uh, Alan, since you're in EMEA in, in the London area, maybe talk about the uh, the, the funding as a whole, and then. Uh, the, uh, Horizon 2020 and then where the Berlin initiative fits into that overall umbrella. Certainly, Jeff. Uh, Horizon 2020 is this interesting initiative that has been launched by the EU Commission. Where basically, they've allocated 80 billion euros worth of, uh, uh, of money uh, for research and development efforts between now and 2020. And roughly, this pot of money that is up for a uh, is available is is allocated across three three buckets three broad buckets excellent science which is somewhat longer term research leadership and in industrial technologies a uh, and also societal challenges interdigital plays in these two latter buckets inside the leadership of industrial technologies you'll find the 5g ppp initiative the 5g public partnership project initiative uh, 700 million euros worth of uh, uh, funding is available uh, for project activities between now and 2020. Uh, you, we are very pleased to announce or to, to have released quite recently that we won one of these one and one of these initiatives with uh, a, our project X Hall initiative. Uh, uh, we're in this project with some 21 partners in Europe, including some very big operator names, Orange, Telecom, Italia, Mobile, Telefonica, uh, OEM partners that you have obviously heard of, Ericsson, Nokia, and, and others. And uh, the focus of this project is to really dig in and explore uh, the challenges of unifying the very, heter the he very heterogeneous challenge that exists in the front hall and back hall space. These are two words that are often sort of thrown out, but really the transport network is really quite a, 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 an array of different technologies uh, today. Uh, you've got different physical layers, you've got different transport layers. And what XHAL is trying to do within the vision of 5G, where we move to a, a, a very, a much more complicated network of ultra dense cells, underlays on, on underlays of, of dense cells, is to create a unified platform uh, whereby front hall and back hall uh, uh, transport resources can be allocated through a common unified SDN framework. So we're exploring extensions to SDN and the southbound interface and northbound interface. We're looking at new frame formatting approaches that can be used on front hall and on the back hall uh, space. So these resources can be managed uh, uh, in a unified manner. And in developing software, developing algorithms, load balancing software, quality of service, policy control software. Uh, that is what drives this underlying fabric. Can you talk about the relationship between uh, this this Berlin project and uh, U-Haul, and um, and the standards body? I mean, you're you're pushing forward with the proof of concept. In fact, before the standards are the inks dry on on any standards being developed. So, what is it? Creative tension. I mean, how would you describe that relationship? No, it's very much symbiotic. Uh, basically, this is the innovation model that exists here in Europe. These. These funded project initiatives tend to serve as a, a, a precursors to standards activities. 
So you've got a very large consortium who's basically working towards a consensus in solving a problem over the space of a couple of years. And one of the products of this project activity will be a standards, uh, standards uh, contributions and standards, uh, you know, standards consensus that ultimately will be taken into bodies like the 3GPP, 3GPP and the IEEE, et cetera. Great. Well, Jim, any uh, last words on the role of software in 5G? Well, uh, you know, as you said, it's a, it's, as you said, it's a very broad, broad topic. And as I said, I think uh, 5G uh, comes, comes uh, in increments uh, along the way of 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, whatever we want to call it along the way. And I think there's a great deal of innovation that happens um, even outside of those standards that will ultimately, when we look back, we'll say, is the, is the, what is 5G? And, and I think that there is a huge software element to it. I think you know, ultimately it all is, abstracts out that hardware and we take for granted those wireless links. It, it, we get to a point where you know, we, have, we have a great uh, amount of coverage and capacity and it's really about what we do with, with that in, in our networks. Well, thanks for your time. I know you're not a product company per se. Uh, you're an R&D company, a licensing technology company, so we look forward to having you as, as guest on future Coder Show and perhaps a few other uh, RCR TV programs in the future. Thank you for your time. Stay on the line. We are going to uh, do a little bit of a debrief, but again, enjoy your week, and thanks for your input.